Alexis, this is going to be old news to anyone who is like kept up to date with news, but I... Oh, you mean like not me? (laughs) I just discovered it and I need you to know about it. So the Berlin Marathon happened for this year, not too distantly in the past. Okay. One competitor ran the entirety of the marathon with an object on his head. And it's not the first time he's done this, but guess what object he had on his head for all 26.2 miles. Like, like strapped to his head? Like balanced to his head? Balanced. What? And not even any glue to be seen on this man's head, apparently. <laughs> so he's an Israeli distance runner named Moshe Lederfein, whose name I'm sure I just butchered, but I don't have any better guesses. <laughs> I've heard it both. <laughs> and there was no other way, but I said it anyway. <laughs> And there's a viral TikTok video. This guy's 68 years old. He he had a pineapple resting comfortably on his bald head. So he even has a magic head. <laughs> no visible tape, straps, rope, or any device keeping the fruit in place. And his body was trudging along at 11 minute mile pace. And his head was keeping perfectly still. That is amazing. I'm in awe. And I love that it was a pineapple. I'm so proud of him. I need it to be known. By any, I mean, anyone. I guess, <laughs> I guess pineapples are like relatively flat on the bottom, but, but heads aren't relatively flat on the top. At least mine's not. Right? How would that, how does that, uh, that's amazing. It looks, okay, there's a picture. It looks like it fits so well on his head. <laughs> <laughs> it's a positive, it's a crown is what it is. <laughs> yes. Yes, stand tall and wear a crown like a pineapple. Heck yeah. Oh, that just that's just like a little bit of joy in the world that I'm thankful for. I don't have any news as good as that, but I want to address Lassiter's mugs before we go on. Ooh. I don't know if this is a bit that begins or if this is simply a bit from this episode, but throughout the episode we find two of Lassiter's mugs, or we see two of Lassiter's mugs, and they have some beautiful quotes on them. I only wrote down the one, so I'm I'm excited to get... You'll have to point out the scene when it comes up in the recap. We will get there in the recap, I, we will talk about it, but I want to put it on note that hopefully we find more Lassiter mugs soon. In that case, shall we start the show? Yes. It's showtime. This is, oh wait, how do we, how do we start the show? Oh, this is To the Blueberry. This is <laughs> to, to the Blueberry! I am Alexis, and I forgot how we start our show, <laughs> um, but I am a real life Gus. I'm Kaylee, I'm the real life Sean, and laughing at you is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. You're not laughing at me, you're laughing with me, because I'm proud of my own craziness. Oh, right, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We are two real life best friends who have decided to do a podcast based on our favorite television show, Psych. And so we'll talk a little bit and it should be a good time to start. We are on season two, episode nine, Bounty Bounty Hunters. Hunters. (laughs) I love it. And like so often, we began in 1987. We're in front of the SBPD. Baby Sean and Baby Gus are nom nomming some ice cream. This really cool car pulls up. Oh, it's so cool. And the boys are just like gobsmacked already. And it just kind of like screeches up to the curb. Cool guy in a vest gets out. He's got like hair for days. Oh, yes. And then he grabs a perp from the other side of his car. And he's dragging him up the steps of the SBP. And hinks at the boys? Yeah. And they're like... He's the coolest, <laughs> and he knows that we know that he's the coolest. Henry comes out, and they say, Hey, Dad, who's that super cool cop, or who's that super cop? Henry is just like, no, he's not a cop. He is a bounty hunter, and he's trying to impart this, like, wisdom upon Sean and Gus, but all Sean can do is envision himself wearing aviator sunglasses, a, a super cool vest, and Dragging that same perp into the building. Only because it's Kevin Sorbo, who is famous for wearing a leather vest. Well, no, not even. He wore leather pants and like a cloth, cloth deep vest. V. Yeah. 
Oh my god. And, but it, it's the look. The look it maintains Hercules. But it also screams Han Solo. Yeah, I, I feel that. And those movies would have been out and still big for kids like Sean and Gus. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that plays into it too. But all oh, the Hercules of it all. <laughs> I did see an interesting connection, I guess you will. Hercules had a spinoff, which was Xena Warrior Princess. Hell yeah, it was. And Lassie, not Lassiter, but the gentleman who plays Lassie, Timothy, had a role on Xena Warrior Princess. Who was he in Xena Warrior Princess? I have no idea. I got that fact off of Amazon. That's so exciting. Yes. I bet he played a real dork, though. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe like a leprechaun. Gosh, I hope you played a leprechaun. I don't even know Somebody if those like were in a warrior princess. Velvety purple be. robe. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, a, maybe a wizard. I could get behind that. Okay, so Henry's like, no. If you're going to catch bad guys, you're going to do it the right way with a badge on your chest. And then like they don't care. All they want to do is look at the really cool guy. And then we cut to present day. We get Lassiter just holding court in the bullpen, and he's like, look at this picture, memorize this picture, this man is Dwayne Tancana. And I just wanted to call him Tin Can the whole time. <gasps> I thought his name was Tin Canna. <laughs> I was like, that says Tan Canna. Oh my gosh, because I've, I've called him Tin Canna since I've ever seen this episode. And this is an iconic Tin- episode, so I've seen it quite a few times. Yeah, I mean, Hercules shows up, right. so... They're talking about Tancana, Tancana, Tancana. We're going to go with both um, because I've heard it both ways. <laughs> I said it twice now. Tancana, Tancana, the gentleman is believed to have been the murderer of one Isabella Cole during. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Back up. He's talking about this man's long ass rap sheet, but he's been charged previously with 12 counts of larceny. And he just got out of a stint doing 36 months. So here's the thing that I need to bring to light. It's very important because this supposed murder during a robbery gone wrong would be a disgusting escalation. Like this man is not a violent offender. Larceny is theft of any personal property of any kind. It's bike thieves. It's pickpocketing. It's barely even burglary because it has so much less potential for violence. Mm -hmm. It's basically just theft without force or violence or fraud. Oh, okay. So he hasn't even made it into the, like, fourth stage of theft. He's still in, like, the the pickpocket line. Yeah, he's like, I take stuff from people. It's a while before they notice stuff is gone. I'm long gone. But sometimes I still get caught. (laughs) So apparently he's not great at it either. (laughs) But you know what I mean? Like, I was just like, wait a second. All of a sudden, he's like, definitely the guy who did this violent crime, a murder of out of everything. And he's a nonviolent offender. Like, yes, he's got a rap sheet. Yes, he's been in prison. But this isn't your guy who's like sticking people up. Well, in the police's defense, they knew he had. (laughs) Hold on. They knew he had been there during the robbery when the murder happened. They brought him in on the charges, including the charges of murder, which is like something police officers do. But he then escaped from them, which is a problem in and of itself. Now, we go on to talk about this a little bit later, but like, like we said it in the last episode, right? I think it was the last episode. Maybe it was two episodes ago. Like, why do the guilty people always run? Well, this guilty person is definitely going to jail for the crime of being present at a at a robbery. Right. And for escaping police. Yes. And now for escaping police. So like ev- evading like custody or whatever. So he's definitely knows he's doing time because he's a repeat offender. Mm-hmm. So that's cut and dry. And he knows that he's on the rack for this murder and the police aren't going to believe him. Right, that's about, that's for sure his fear. Yeah. So I'm like, of course we need someone outside like Sean to take a look at something like this because this never bodes well for somebody in, in Tancana's position. But from the offset, I'm just like, mm, this is a weird escalation of this guy's crimes. Is it like our last episode where the crime in progress was interrupted and it was just like a... Well, okay, but... That quickly gets quashed because we find out how she was murdered. 
And it wasn't just like, grab the first thing I see, whack you over the head, oops, you're dead. Right. It was a, it was it more was, of a crime It was a very intentional, it was a very intentional murder. Like, the kind of murder you have to mean because of how it's committed. Anyway, go on. I'm sorry. I interrupt you big time. No, it's okay. So, yes, they, he did escape. He happened to escape from Juliet. Juliet made a poor decision. The police officer that was escorting her bent down to tie her shoe, his shoe, whomever's shoe, and Tin Canna, Tan Canna, I'm just going to call him Tin Canna, and Tin Can <laughs> headbutted her in the forehead. She ended up with a little bandage, but no super crazy fear or harm. But she just got up in front of the entire police station and admitted it all. That, okay, that's a very, I don't know, I feel like it's a very Libra move of her. <laughs> I think it's a very courageous move of her to just that, get up there and be like, you know what, I messed up, here's what I did, we're okay. Yeah, it's like getting ahead of it, like, you know, it's gonna be said, I messed up, I'm acknowledging that, you know, I should have hung back. That's the one thing, like, she didn't do anything wrong, her fellow officer stopped back Maybe she didn't notice early enough, or maybe she just didn't walk slowly enough, but, like, she didn't hang back, and then he got the drop on her. She could have been concussed. I mean, she stares off into space a lot this episode, does, that's true. for the record. Oh, I, I wrote, not really, the guy just got lucky. He's, like, an opportunist. Yeah, he is. That's larceny. He's an opportunist, and he's really good at escaping. <laughs> but, um... We will find that out very soon. <laughs> Lassie turns to our beloved... <laughs> Buzz McNabb. Oh, Buzz. And just screams, McNabb, coffee. Poor Buzz is just like, I, I put it in the conference room. Mm -hmm. And then cut to the conference room and we see Hercules. We see, that, <laughs> we see the bounty hunter and the bounty hunter is drinking <laughs> Lassie's coffee. On this coffee mug that Lassiter gets very <laughs> upset with uh, about in the next scene. It says, shoot first, drink coffee later, which is not a good slogan for life, Lassiter. Not a good slogan for cops. Not yet. Not a good slogan for anybody. But in the <laughs> constructs of that, which is Carlton Lassiter, okay, fair. Not only is the bounty hunter in there, but the dead woman's husband is also in there. We find out that he, Mr. Cole, whose name I never, first name I never really got, all right, maybe I did. We'll get there later. Yeah, I wrote it down. It's We'll get there. Yeah. He had hired the bounty hunter and offered a $50,000 reward for the capture in return of Tin Canna. So Lassie asks who the dude drinking his coffee is. Jules. Yeah, it's Jules who says that that's Bird Tatum's. He's a bounty hunter. There's a 50000 bounty on Tin Canna. And Lassie turns and screams to everyone, no bounty hunters in this precinct. Like, foot down. Like, too bad, bruh. He was hired by the dead woman's husband, Loman Cole. Loman. Everyone's name sucks. Dwayne Tancana, Loman Cole, Bird Tatums. Like, he's Hercules. Yeah. Shut up, he's Hercules. <laughs> Juliet is just kind of distraught, and she's trying to make up for the fact that she knows that she was the one who let this man's wife's killer escape. And she's like, I've, I've got this. I, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to help. And Lassiter, I think very politely, yet also very jerkily said, no, I'm going to go do that. I need you to stay here. And she's like, why are you punishing me just because I made a single mistake? Here's the thing. I think it's not a wrong move. And I don't think... He's punishing her as much as it feels like he's punishing her to her in that moment because she's really in her head about this. She's already in the quicksand, so she's too overwrought. And so keeping her there to do like the background research and benching her a little bit, but like keeping her on the case, I think, I think was the right move. No, I completely agree. And like simply from a PR standpoint, it makes sense not to have the one who, quote, let the prisoner go, out there also being the front line of defense. If people see that, they're going to talk, they're going to be angry. Like, from a PR perspective, it's a good idea not to do that. So I support it, but I could understand how Juliet probably feels. But mm -hmm. Chief Vic is out of town, and 
Lassiter said, with her out of town, I've got to do what's right. I've got to do my best. We've got every bit of manpower on this case. And Juliet just goes, every, every? bit? And she pulls <laughs> out her cell phone. What and, are you doing? <laughs> are you going to call them or should I? Juliet calls Sean and Lassiter takes the phone and he has to like <laughs> eat his words and ask for them to help him, which they do. Yeah, Lassie sort of plays in that like he's like along and in on this. And the boys arrive immediately and they see that Bird is there and they instantly fanboy. Oh, yes. Lassiter kind of takes him aside and says, hey, listen, I need you to psychically divine some things. We need to stay ahead of this. I can't stand bounty hunters, first of all. But he does this sort of like stacking thing with his hands. Like cops, way up here, like at, at the forehead. And bounty hunters, way down here, like closer to the belly button. And psychics are just a knuckle above that. And Sean is so psyched about being like above bounty hunters. He's like, we still beat them. <laughs> they make this comment about Bird where they're like, he looks exactly the same as he did when we were kids. Which I love. <laughs> because we keep kind of going back to this trope of Henry looking exactly the same. The young kid from episode seven looking exactly the same as he did 15 years ago. And now we got Bird looking exactly the same as he did 15 years ago. Which he does. Same vest. Same Sean Cassidy hair. Everything. <laughs> I like to say I have Sean Cassidy hair. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, Bird has been hired. He knows who his quarry is. Why is he still hanging out at the police precinct? I can't quite figure that out either he doesn't have to get the police's permission to do this no and is he like trying to pick up some tidbit of a lead like cheater lassie tells sean and gus that the issue is that isabella was strangled and mr cole was knocked out with a vase and that's kind of the story that's kind of what's happening after they're finished talking to the bounty hunter and mr cole they kind of walk out and sean said that dude has amazing hair. Do you smell that? And Gus said, of course I do. It's ginger blossoms. <laughs> it's a special hair product called kangaroo paste. It's from Australia. You super can't get it. Yeah. Right. And then he said, maybe he has a connection from down under. Because Sean really wants kangaroo paste. Which cuts to our opening credits. And then after the credits, the boys actually confront Bird and he's kind of a little bitch. <laughs> well, they're like, fangirls, so it doesn't make that, it's not that big of a difference. I don't know. They're like, you know, oh, we're, we're on here as bounty hunters and we're really big fans, man. And do you have any like advice? And he just like dunks on them. He's like, if I play my cards right, this is my last job and I can retire. And the boys look around quickly. Like, oh, <laughs> usually if somebody's about to retire, they get shot at. But yeah, he's just kind of a jerk. Sean gets defensive and he's like, oh, sorry, we didn't, you know, buy the bounty hunter accessory kit and we don't have, like, the cool leather bracelets that are apparently <laughs> necessary. And, like, <laughs> then Bird badmouths Juliet. Like, it's just awful. And the boys are like, you even winked at us. How can you not remember us from when we were children? And we were, like, so excited to see you. And he's like, wink. My face just kind of does that. I have, a, I have a twitch. What does he say the reason is? I didn't write it down. Uh, it's a muscle spasm he, that creates a twitch or something like that. Yeah. So he's like, stay out of my way. Blah, blah, blah. So he leaves the precinct finally. Like, dude, why were you hanging out? As he's leaving, he kind of just turns around and very aggressively goes. And these, and he points at his wrist bracelet things. <laughs> these don't come in tiny. Sean's like, uh, easy fix. Just get a women's large. <laughs> The moral of the story is don't meet your heroes because this guy was their childhood hero and he just turned into an a-hole. There was a Tango and Cash reference earlier that had something to do with Bird buying a bar in Key West, but I don't 100% know how it went, so just throwing it out there. Oh, no, I know what that was. He was like, ah, because after this I want to retire. I already put down a down payment on a bar in the Key West. And I forget if it's Sean or Gus, though. One of them goes, who are the other investors? Tango and Cash. Yeah, it was Gus for sure. <laughs> but Sean chuckled at it. We go to talk to Juliet, and she's really in her head still, and she's at her computer. 
Is she doing her gun thing in this? Or yeah, she's she doing her gun later? thing here. She's she's do- disassembling and reassembling her gun. And timing herself. And she did it in 26 seconds. But the boys are like, let's let's talk through this. Let's let's see if we can generate a lead. They pull up the surveillance footage of his escape. Yeah, Julia was watching that while she was doing her gun resetting thing. And I was like, girl, why are you punishing yourself? She just is. But Sean zeroes in on the fact that the guy's got some sort of medical bracelet on. And so he's like, Jules, is he diabetic or does he have some kind of like heart condition or something? And she's like, yeah, how'd you know? And he's like, oh, I just got a psychic vibration. But the whole hand to the head thing, I just, I've got a really nice lean going here. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, they're like, well, does he have any like family in the area? Any known, you know, haunts or anything? And she's like, we've kind of run all this down, but yeah, he's got a cousin who works at this diner. But that was the first place we went to look. Come on. Well, the boys go to the diner anyway. Of course they do. Cousin was just looking at them and very nonchalantly lying to their faces and saying, oh, haven't seen him in months. I thought he was in jail. He's the line cook at this diner. Mm -hmm. For the record, love a greasy spoon. But Sean's paying attention to the people who are actually in the diner and the food this guy's making. We've got two truckers fighting over the ketchup. They're waiting on these burgers. They've got this other dude who's clearly the guy waiting on the Reuben. Because he has the Russian dressing. Ah, he's already got the Russian dressing. And for some reason, our cousin here is scrambling egg whites, which would be important if you're on a special diet for our heart heart condition. condition. Okay, I love this. By the way, they're geniuses, but I want to go back to Ruben Guy. Okay. I want you to take your take your little brain and scroll all the way back to season one, episode one, to the convenience store or electronic store clerk who was robbing his own. Oh, you guys oh can't see Kaylee's gosh. face. It's the same guy. The guy we caught from the video on the news? Yes. Oh my gosh. I, I did love it. not catch that at all. I looked at him and I was like, dude, I know that face. He's been in an episode before. And then it all oh, was so perfect. I was like, episode one, there it is. I love that for us. So this is our second time that we have seen the same character playing, a di- or the same person playing a different character. And it will continue to happen for sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. They see a sign that says staff only, and they see kind of a shadowy figure walking behind the staff only sign, and they are certain that it's Tancana. And then they have this moment of certain terms versus uncertain terms. It's just kind of beautiful. And they can't really agree on what to do next, but oops, too late, because now Bird is here. Frickin' Hercules slamming out of his car running into the building, jumping over the diner bar, running to the back, like pushing the guy's cousin out of the way, all muscle. So he's grabbing Tincana from the back room. Well, Tincana hops through this like short order cook window. Oh, and he's trying to escape because, yeah. Right, and grabs him and then Bird shoves his face into a burger and (sighs) is like cuffing him and, oh, I got this, I'm good. And then in true Tincana fashion... He headbutts him and runs away. (laughs) And the boys have not moved a muscle and they're just like watching all this go down. They didn't even come to like a decision about what they were going to do. And so they just kind of (laughs) leave. Maybe they think they're going to like follow him because they knew he ran. It was just kind of weird, but they were like, "Eh, we're done here. Bye. But no worries. Sean is like, oh my God, this is so weird. What are we going to do? But Gus is like, get out of here. But Sean grabs the keys. He's like, no, let's think about this. And then up from the back pops Dwayne Tancana. Can I call him Dwayne the Rock Tancana? (laughs) 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 He's like, well, that guy's coming out of there, so we better get going. And so they speed off and... Hercules sees them speed off with the guy in their car. Tankana is like uncuffing himself. Gus is doing this crazy tactical driving with this like great sound cue over the top. <laughs> but I do want to go back 
to when we were in the diner fighting about whether or not we should confront Tancana. Sean said, somebody forgot to drink their courageous juice this morning. And I want to point that out because later he makes another comment like that. And it flows just oh. a little bit through. So, good times. Cool. Okay. Sean, so, Sean introduces himself as a psychic detective, as a psychic detective, and this is my partner, Galileo Bumpkins. I got Humpkins. Uh, I actually wrote Pumpkins, but I thought it was Bumpkins, <laughs> but it might have been Humpkins. <laughs> I don't know. But this is the first time that Gus is very excited that he did not use his real name. Dwayne is saying, like, there's no way that the cops aren't going to get me for this murder or they're going to listen to me or anything because I was there. Yeah, I was at the robbery, but I wasn't alone. And he's like, I had a partner. His name was, I wrote Gord Del Becchio. We just call him Del Becchio for the rest of the episode. So that's what we're going to call him. He directed Dwayne to go into the basement to disarm the alarm so that they could burgle the house in the quiet. The lady was murdered on the second floor. So he never even got to that part of the house, apparently. They're like, um, what does your attorney say about this? You know, you could have worked something out and told this story and blah, blah, blah. He goes, I don't have an attorney. I have a public defender. The cops are never going to listen. And if they go looking for Del Becchio, they're never going to find him. That guy's peaced out already. Which is a very understandable feeling. Like, dude's been in the system. He knows how this works. He's already going to be under suspicion. Anything else that can be thrown at him is going to stick, probably. So he's just like, uh, I'm on the run either way. We end up cutting back to the Santa Barbara Police Department. Bird and Cole are in the conference room with Juliet and Lasseter. Bird has an ice pack on his head from where Tancana headbutted him. And Cole is mad. Weak! (laughs) <laughs> well, okay, okay. I feel like I've been doing this a lot this episode, but I'm going to do it here too. First of all, if this trained bounty hunter, who's freaking Hercules, can get the drop from Tim Hanna, why are we so upset with Juliet? Like Juliet's the one who's most upset with Juliet. Yeah. I think everybody else is mitigating the situation in the right ways, but she's the one going full tilt at herself over this. Even though Bird did the same thing. And he's got a cool vest. Mm -hmm. Bird is like, they drove off. I couldn't catch him. They were in this blue Echo. He was with those idiots. It was a child's car. (laughs) You know, that one that's a psychic or whatever. And then Lassiter immediately calls Sean. And he's like, you bring him back here now. Or I'm going to charge you both with harboring a fugitive. And Jules gets on the phone and she's like, listen, don't buy into his story. He will say anything. Just don't, you know, don't get sidetracked by this. Get get him back. When Lassiter said, I'll charge you both for harboring a fugitive, Sean said, wow, someone didn't drink their grateful juice this morning. So we had a courageous juice and a grateful juice. Juliet's like, let us send some black and whites to come get you. We want you to be safe. And <laughs> Sean said, Gus, do you want a black and white cookie? Tim Canna, you want it a cookie? It just made me think of Eaton Park cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's my favorite kind of black and white, so I'm in. And then we find out that Tim Canna can't eat weast. Weast? That's wheat and yeast. <laughs> wheat or yeast. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a bag full of excitement, y'all. But Tancano, they get off the phone eventually. Tancano insists that his partner kept bragging about working something big. It was kind of on the side. He was bragging about how much money he was going to be thrown and swimming in and blah, blah, blah. So he's like, I got to check this out. I, I know, like, basically where to find him right at this second. And I've got the directions, but I can't tell you where it is. It, it was something about going down the street right on Calabri and it's a house right there. He said that and it's good that he said that because something's going to happen later. Sean makes this face of like, ooh, maybe we should go check it out. And Gus just goes, what is that face, Sean? Hmm. And then we get a Gus don't be. But I don't like this Gus don't oh. be. Because it's a... What does what he tell Gus, him? don't be a little girl about this. 
Oh, yeah, that's stupid. They get to the station. I didn't even write it down. Yeah. I wouldn't have if it wasn't a Gus Don't Be because I don't like that one. They get to the station. They call Juliet. The cavalry comes running out. And Sean and Gus are handcuffed to the blueberry. I love that so much. Gus is ready to go. Gus is like, I'm leaving. I'm going home. I'm going to take a nice lap. It's going to be fine. And Sean said, okay, I'll come with you. It's been a long time since we've napped together. But let's make a quick stop first. This time, Sean starts driving. And then we cut to them on Henry's boat. Ah, yes. The little motorboat. Gus is bad. He's like, I told you, I'm retired. And then they duck again. Which, it, that has to be a reference to something, but I don't know what it is. I don't either. Is it maybe? No, I don't know. So here's what the phrase retired makes me think of. This is a very niche Twitter meme from a girl who says, I am retired in the sense that I was tired yesterday and I am once again tired today. <laughs> Sean said, he said, take a right on Calabria and there's this little house, but he didn't mean house. He meant house boat. And they see a big boat out in the middle of the ocean. There's no reason for this to be there. It's not a good fishing spot. There's really nothing there. This is where that guy lives. That guy. It's hella creepy and like decrepit. Yeah. (laughs) Gus does not want to get up on this houseboat. And Sean's like, okay, you can stay here. Just be careful of the sharks. I don't know that my dad's boat is shark proof. So what does Gus do? He gets on the boat. Sean is like, this looks just like the boat from Dead Calm. And Gus goes, great. Now we have to worry about Billy Zane, too. This is our first Billy Zane, isn't it? I think so. No. Mm, I can't guarantee that. There might have been at least one other one up till now, but it was a brief one. So, so there was definitely a, a Titanic one. reference. Okay. Which might have know. been it. But I don't know. This was the first one I clocked as an actual Billy Zane reference, but I'm with you. I'm not sure. They're sneaking up on the boat. But don't worry, because Dwayne hears them. And he's just there to find the evidence, some evidence that he needs to make sure that he does not go down for this murder. And Sean's like, well, let me help. That's what I'm here for. And he instantly goes, these are shredded up cash straps. <laughs> he was like, this person had at least two to 3,000 in stacks. And I was like, you don't, you don't strap cash in those amounts. You just don't. Like, some weird, like, regular people might choose to do that, but financial institutions don't do that. A strap of tens is $1,000. But at most, there would have been three straps. Unless it was completely in ones. There was a yellow strap and a purple strap. Like those are tens This makes no sense. I hate it when the show does that. Like (laughs) doesn't make any sense. Gus found a phone, which was helpful, but Sean found the necklace and has a flashback to the pictures of Isabella's neck. There was this imprint on her neck that was obviously made by this necklace. For the record, she was strangled with somebody's bare hands. Yep. That's not like a sudden desperate thing you do if you're just trying to escape. Like a person being hit with a vase makes total sense. Yep. That'd be fine. But then why strangle and not, like, no. I'm not buying it. I'm just not buying it. I, I'm going back to the statement, crime of passion. That that was a, you, you don't strangle somebody for no reason. You strangle somebody because you're really, really mad. Crime of passion makes me think it wasn't premeditated. But to me, strangulation feels more premeditated. That's fair. We get gunshots. And they're like, oh my gosh, yes. it's a bird. And then Henry calls. Ugh. <laughs> He's like, hey, Sean, are you still coming to dinner tonight? <laughs> Sean looked at Gus and said, are we still going to my dad's for dinner tonight? And then there's another gunshot, which Henry hears, and he's not happy. He also already said, it sounds like you're on a boat. And Sean's like, oh, that's nothing. We're just watching a movie. It's Midnight Run. Midnight Run. Have you seen it? And then just straight up hangs up on Henry. So Bird is on the boat. Sean is, like, looking at the dials, looking at the dials, looking at the dials. Finally, he hits the gas. Bird flies off the boat. The boys run to the back after they stop the boat they're on. Their boat's not attached, so it's in the distance. 
and Bird is back, and we get this wild, like, Walker, Texas Ranger music cue, <laughs> some dog the bounty hunter reality show bullshit. Like <laughs> They don't know what to do, and so they ultimately decide that they have to jump. Because Bird says he's going to shoot them. Which is fair. It's, this guy's unhinged. But when those jumps happen, Kaylee, <laughs> those stunt doubles are so bad. <laughs> it was just like oh look those are three totally different people oh my gosh i'm going back to that i have to go back and watch now i just have to oh my gosh i don't know how you didn't notice it right off the bat but i was taking notes i'm sure <laughs> so there maybe i was paying close attention to it because there is one episode of psychologists are in where they're talking about how much rode hates water he doesn't like to be in water. He doesn't like to be on water. He doesn't like to deal with water. And so when they were jumping, I was like, oh, man, it's definitely going to be a stunt double. And then they were all stunt doubles. But then Sean ends up in the water. And this is not stunt doubles. It's Sean and Gus straight up in the water getting picked up by Bird. Because Dwayne swam to their boat so fast and just peaced out and left them like they are trying to help you but bird is also hot on the tail yeah. so so we go back to the diner the boys walk up and juliet's there staring vacantly into space just completely overwrought i use the word catatonic and when uh, she yeah. does finally start talking she's sad and she's mad and she's angry and, like, all of those negative emotions are just kind of digging into her. And she's just like, I have this voice always telling me the right thing to do. And then one day that voice stopped talking to me. And it, I messed up so big. Part of me thinks that the reason she's blaming herself this hard is because Tankana was telling her the same thing. Like, I wasn't in that part of the house. I wasn't there alone. Blah, blah, blah. And maybe she felt some softening towards him like, as to whether or not he was guilty prior to his escape, and she felt duped. Even though she didn't wasn't, like, allowing him to escape on purpose, like, mm -hmm. but that softened her enough that she wasn't vigilant enough. That's possible. Is kind of where I went with it. I just watched that scene of them jumping into the water, and they were pretty good stunt doubles. Come on. No. They had the right hair. They had the right skin tones. They did have the right skin tones. They had the right tones. weight. They not, might have been the wrong height. Not Tankana. Mm -hmm. He was. His guy was, like, diving, and he had full belly. Mm, mm, mm. He maybe mm. had, like, a thinner face, but he was wearing a wig. Like, yeah, he had he to be. This point in the episode, Sean and Gus do not know how to console Juliet. Juliet has all of the evidence, folder, paper, sheet, just kind of sitting. And Sean puts his hand on Juliet's hand on top of the evidence folder. And I can't tell if Sean is saying, please leave this folder here for us, or if this is Sean trying to console her. Bye, bye. I think he's trying really hard to console yeah. her. Yeah. So she pulls her hand away. She's like, you know what? You keep the folder. I'm done. And then just leaves. Well, she starts to walk away and Gus sort of points at it. And she's like, you know what? Keep it. Like, I'm out. They start going through it and they see a... Is it a tattoo picture of his back? Yep. Gus says, this is Barb. We should dig through his life and see if he has any known associates or anything, anyone who can be traced, Barb or Barbara. And Sean kind of like highlights it with his observant skills. And it says bar 13. So they show up at this dive. It's like <laughs> real dusty and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's a biker bar called bar 13. And... The outline of bar 13 is barbed wire, which is not questionable at all. And as they're walking in, Gus is like, uh, this is not very family friendly. Oh, come on. It's just going to be just like Roadhouse. Gus said, fine, <laughs> but I'm Patrick Swayze. Cool. Sam Elliott. <laughs> <laughs> the gentlemen go up to the bar and they're like, can you give us a list of your house whites, please? The guy behind the counter is like, uh, I don't know what fraternity sent you in here, but you better get out. Is that what he said? I could not make out what that guy was saying. Sean's like, I know he's here. I'm a psychic. Give us tin canna. I'm going to count to three. Okay. 
is it to Gus or is it to the bartender that he's like, we're looking for this guy, so high, so stout. Um, he's saying it to the bartender. Is that when he calls him a Pisces? Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. So Tankana, Pisces. <laughs> I'm going to count to three. One, two, and then where he should have said three, we cut to a scene of them hanging upside down from in chains chain. in the middle of the bar. Yeah, and we've got a real menacing dude coming at them with a chain, and he's stopped by none other than Tankana. Like, this, this is a good dude, mm-hmm. all right? <laughs> They're here for me. Let me handle it. I'm really starting to believe that you're a psychic, Sean. You traced me here, so uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you down, and you're going to use your psychic gift to help me catch Del Vecchio. They agree, but Sean takes a look at one of the menacing guys in the crowds and is like, all right, but I get his best. <laughs> <laughs> the three of them walk out. Sean, Gus, and Canna, and Sean has on that guy's vest. It's a leather vest, much like birds. I wrote open water movie reference. They say, okay, we need to get home so we can check Del Becchio's phone. We need to dry it out, and then we'll be able to plug it in and see what's going on. And Gus is like, um, I wouldn't have gotten the phone wet. Maybe if you would have tied up the boat, we wouldn't have been swimming around like the couple from open water. That's it. So they get in the blueberry, and they're headed to the psych office. But they instantly see birds car out front and bird like stalking the front entrance of the psych office so they can't go there and they all duck down and the blueberry's still moving well that's because and he knows sean screams duck it's bird duck it's bird duck it's bird but here's the thing bird knows that car so that car can't just idle down the road <laughs> without people whatever it. <laughs> they get away and gus goes Where are we going to go that's safe to have, like, a wanted criminal, essentially? He says something else, but that's the gist. The best place to go, which is Henry's. We're at Henry's. Sean's like, I know Dad's gone getting stuff for the dinner that he's going to make that I'm supposed to come to tonight. I can't guarantee he's going to be gone long, so we got to hurry up with this phone thing. Not too much more happens before Henry does indeed come home. And what's-his-face comes out from the other room. Tinkana comes out from the other room, and they introduce him as an old camp counselor of Gus's and mine, Whitefeather, from Camp Tiki Mama Jamma. Tiki Hama. <laughs> I'm wearing my Camp Tiki Hama wonderful shirt right now today, folks, it's and I do intend shirt. to get more. It's a great summer shirt. Is Tiki Mama Jamma a reference to Bad Mama Jamma? Oh, I'm sure it is. Okay. They leave Tinkana with Henry. And they go into the next room to work on the phone. Gus got it to work, but the image is really, really bad. We go back and Henry is questioning Tinkana. And he's just trying to make crap up to get Henry to believe him. And then ends up referring to little baby Sean as a great kid. A wonderful kid. A real stickler for the rules. (laughs) Henry's face. He's like, this man is terrible at lying. (laughs) (laughs) We go back to Sean and Gus. And they see that the letters on the kind of messed up phone. And (laughs) Sean's like, pick a letter. Because apparently he wants to play hangman to try to figure out what it said. After a lot of back and forth of no, do it, no, do it, no, do it. Gus ends up guessing T-U-L-J-N-X. In which point he hangs man. At which point he hangs the man. Hangs the man. Hangs the man. Thank you. (laughs) Hangman's hangs the man. And it is a full-on <laughs> Gus hangman with a high talk fade and a speech bubble that says, I love coins. Also, we got a funny note from Sean. Because <laughs> it was rapid fire guessing of the letters. And he was like, no, no, no. <laughs> they decipher the memo, the letter, the, the text to say, money drop off Meadow Park. They're doing a googly search. And... Right as they figure out that there is no meadow park, but there is a meadow parking, Henry comes in and he's like, listen, what are you trying to pull? This guy is no camp counselor. And Sean's like, dad, listen. And Henry's like, okay, no, I I don't even want to know. Just go. Get it away from me. (laughs) They do leave and they head to meadow parking in the blueberry with Tenkana. Instantly. They drive past a pillar. 
that labels the area of the parking garage. Do you know what's on that pillar? No. Pineapple hunt. There's a pineapple on the pillar. Oh my god. It's. I have to stop looking down doing my notes. It's big and obvious. I was really bad at this episode. Drive right past it. It's okay. Well, in my defense, I only... I only watch this one once for the notes. Like, it, it's always better if I watch it twice. It I, really I didn't catch it during notes. I caught it during the second watch. There is a dead guy, and it is Del Vecchio. <sighs> and they're like, oh, no, this is bad. Gus refuses to get out of the car and screams, no touchy dead body, Sean. And he rolls up his window. <laughs> but then Bird comes along and grabs Tenkana, cuffs him. Throws him against the car, throws him in the car, and drives away really quickly. Sean is gobsmacked. He's very much like, what? How? Okay. He did that so fast. (laughs) And then he's smelling, and he was like, what is... Gus, come here. No. No, Gus, Gus, seriously. No. Gus, come here. No. Gus, I need you to come here. I need the super sniffer. To which Gus responds, I'm not bringing the super smeller out there. (laughs) So we have heard it both ways. We've heard it both ways. We knew we had. And it just is continuing. Sean literally is picking up this dead guy's hand and like blowing it towards the blueberry so Gus can smell it. And then he does smell it. So he gets out of the car. Oh, is that? Oh, no, he didn't. (laughs) I'll be... (laughs) <laughs> I smelled that before. I know, dude, right? <laughs> they need to stop Bird from taking Tenkana in. They need to actually solve the case. And Gus is like, well, what, how are we going to stop him? It's not like we have $50,000 in a briefcase somewhere. And Sean goes, thanks, buddy. And then they are headed to the Santa Barbara Police Department. This scene is like a lot. Um, So we're confronting Bird outside the SBPD. And... Sean and and Gus step in front of him before he can get get to the steps. And he's very menacing. And he's like, you are not standing in my way this time, Spencer. And they tell Bird that Tancana told them where all the stash stuff from the robbery was. So that's where they went. And that's what's in this briefcase. And he's like, you're waiting on a $50,000 payday, but this is so much bigger. And he's like, oh, yeah? then why don't you take it? And my first thought was that they were going to be like, we're just breaking into this business. You're trying to get out of it. Make room. But like, they didn't quite go that way. And there's a whole discourse about, is this a briefcase? Or is this this an attache case? And what's the difference? And Gus says, an attache case doesn't have as hard a shell. And Sean says, is that that the only distinction? He was like, Sean said, okay, we will trade you what's in this briefcase for Tinkana. It is four times that $50,000 payoff that you're trying to get. For those of you playing at home, that's $200,000. They're like, we're not doing it for the money. This time, we're doing it for the girl. Because they're trying to save Juliet. Mm. Big heart. Big. Gus pretends to walk away in true negotiating fashion. He's like, you know what? This guy wouldn't know a good deal if it hit him upside the head. And Bird's like, no, 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 no. Wait. You give me the money. I'll give you Tankana. There's this whole back and forth that ends with, you think this is my first money for hostage exchange? Same time. <laughs> so they do the handoff. Bird opens up the suitcase only to find a whole bunch of expired medical swabs. Expired eczema swabs, they said. Expired eczema swabs. <laughs> I have eczema, so I always notice when it's mentioned. <laughs> Bird pulls out a gun, and Gus is like, this was your big idea? And then the cavalry comes running out. And Sean said, no, this was my idea. Oh, and then Lasseter has a wonderful line. He pulls his gun on Bird and said... As much as I'd like to shoot these two from time to time, you cannot pull a gun on innocent civilians. Now drop it. Pass me the satchel. Satchel! That's... (laughs) But it's like, you idiot, you're in front of a police 
uh-huh. precinct. And he's like, I have a license to carry. It's like, so the hell what? You don't have a license to use it for no damn reason. <laughs> Oh, my God. They put Bird and Tincana in cuffs, and they walk into the building, and the boys' wrap-up music is playing. Like, the cue that usually plays at the end of the episode when everything is good, everything's ready. And Sean said, how about that nap? Gus is like, haven't you forgotten something? Yeah, I know you need a nightlight. No, Sean. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, I'm running inside. So they stop Jules, Lassie, and Tancana in the corridor, and they're like, wait, 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 wait. So we get our full psych out breakdown here, and he's like, you got the wrong guy. We skipped something, because out there with everybody is Loman Cole during the, the, oh, the showdown. yeah, that's true. And then he goes in with all of them. He's like, thank God we, we got him, though. And then he's there in the corridor when Sean comes in to do the breakdown confrontation. They were like, it wasn't Tancana. It was coal and it's all because you were greedy what do you mean i'm not greedy i have enough money it's not greedy for money it's greeting for fabulous hair he used the robbery to cover up the murder by strangling his wife while the robbery was going on and then he knocked on himself using a vase but dobecchio was there he took the necklace's collateral and blackmailed coal into paying for his silence he paid him one time but that wasn't enough so he set up this drop, and then just like before, he strangled him and murdered Dovecchio. Except for your greediness, not for money, for fabulous hair. Unlike your first victim, Del Vecchio fought back. There's something. I can see it. No, no, mostly I can smell it. All over Del Vecchio's hands. Juliet's like, well, do you have an alibi, Cole? And Cole was like, no, I don't need an alibi. I'm not guilty. And Juliet said, well, we'll just check the cameras in the garage. And Cole was like, there were no cameras in that parking garage. Keep being stupid, criminals. Keep being stupid. Everyone makes crazy faces. They cuff him. Sean and Gus do a little happy dance. And then all is well. Yes, all is well. Kind of. Um, sort of. I made so many noises during this closing scene. That's okay. Um, but Sean is very much like, um, robbery is... Better than murder, right? <laughs> like, sorry we couldn't get you off completely, but you're not going down for something you didn't do. <laughs> and what's his name? Uh, Dwayne um, Tin Can. He seems fine with it. Yeah. And as the, he's walking away, he screams back, the vest looks good. <laughs> there is this moment where Lassiter is kind of upset that the boys have kind of built this relationship with Tin Canna. And... He said, what, what are you guys friends now? Uh, I'm going to be looking into what you've been doing for the last 48 hours. And Sean said, next time you reprimand us, you might try using your feelings voice. Otherwise, all we hear is. <laughs> <laughs> there is a fist bump and the scene ends. We are back at Juliet's desk at the Santa Barbara Police Department and Sean enters. It's after hours, everything's dark, and he walks up, and we get, it's kind of nice, it's like, you know, I'm glad it all worked out. That's what friends are for. Yeah, she was like, thanks for all your help, like, she she gives props when the boys help her out, like, she knows when she needs it and how to take it, and he puts his hand on her and says, that's what friends are for, and then he steps very, very close to her, and their faces are all but touching. <laughs> She's like, what is happening right now? She's like, because if it is what I think it is, that would be a wrong move here. And he's like, I like to call it very close talking. <laughs> She's like, I forget what she says. Like something like, well, do you have anything else to talk about? Or do you have anything else to say? And he makes his hmm, and he purses his lips when he does it. So he touches her upper lip with both of his lips. He's also shaking his head no in the time. So it's like, "Mm." (laughs) oh, God. And I was like, this is so much worse than if he just kissed her. (laughs) Like, I was like, I was sweating. (laughs) How does one, how, who, anyway. Then he's like, no, I'm good. Or I think I'm good. No, that's all I need for now. 
That's it. Turns around. Sean walks away with the biggest smile on his face. And Juliet immediately starts resetting her gun again. Like, disassembling. Like, <laughs> my face hurts right now. Like, I <laughs> Kaylee's got the biggest grin on her face. Okay, I don't know what, if you remember this, but when this episode aired, this was at the time when you and I were watching it tandemly and calling each other. And I just remember picking up the phone and calling you, or you picked up the phone and called me, and you were like, did you just watch that? Did you just see that? They almost kissed. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. This felt like... Okay, when they used to play these last scenes, they would be after a commercial break or something, Mm -hmm. like the last commercial break. So it would almost feel like an addition because we've already got the show wrapped up. Right. And then you have a commercial. And if you're still around, you get this one little extra piece of scene. And then instead of our theme song, at the end of this episode, we get... This part we glossed over a little bit when Tankana was talking to Henry in the kitchen alone. And he he asked what he was a counselor of. And Tankana, as White Feather, said, Oh, you know, drama and and, and music. He's like, Oh, drama and music. He's like, Yes, musically. Original uh, stuff mostly. Camp songs. And he's like, Camp songs? Oh, that's. Well, sing me one. Don't you remember any? And he's like, No, it's been a long time. He's like, Oh, come on. Sing. <laughs> so the song we get in the credits is the song that Tankana was making up on the spot. So that song was written and recorded by the Friendly Indians. Who, who also do the theme song. Also do the theme. Who is also the band of Steve Franks. Oh, yeah. I think yeah, I knew that. It's his band. Show creator. Yeah. Clever. Is he, what does he play in the band? Who is he in the band? I have no idea. I just know from facts (laughs) that I looked up. Love that. Yeah. But this was a mid-season break. Oh. Yeah. This was a a last episode before the holiday break. Because we do get a holiday episode, which is coming up next. Coming up next, y'all. To the blooper. But this is a really, really good episode. And this is a super iconic episode. I love Hercules in it. I love... Everything Hercules, about it. Hercules, 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 Hercules. The only thing I don't like is that we don't get any chief back. Yeah, we got mention of her because she's out of town conveniently. Yeah. But and every, otherwise, it is a it is a full on episode. We get a lot of good references. We get a lot of good kind of normal things. There's so much hair going on in this episode. It's just beautiful. <laughs> there is a lot of hair. Even Tankana has really long hair. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm Alexis. I cheated death three times in the last seven hours, and I'm not going to go out by electrocution. And I'm Kaylee. Wow. I think I hate that guy. <laughs> and this has been... To, to the, the Blurry! Psych out. <laughs>